Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, good to see that we still get some attendance, even though the food's not here. Ho hopefully, to return at some point. Um, anyways, um, so uh, welcome to our usual Thursday research conference. I see a few faces of people I don't know. That's always a good thing. Um, and this uh, particular conference is a, um, a PhD dissertation proposal defense in our program, as most of you know, um, in order to uh, move on to actually do your dissertation, you need to defend your plan in public, and that's what um, uh, Issa Mayari is going to do today. And so I will introduce him. I don't want to take a lot of his time. He'll, he'll give a talk, and then we can ask questions, challenge him, uh, whatever. Um, so um, Issa um, has uh, been in our program for, um, I guess, since 2013. Um, he has his uh, uh, BS in biology and chemistry from Portland State um, and uh, received a master's in biochemistry and molecular biology here from OHSU. Um, he worked in the um, lab of the famous uh, Dr. Lewis Picker, um, who is uh, developing um, HIV vaccine and other things. Um, and for his dissertation, he's um, focusing on a current computational bottleneck for robust identification of rare cellular subsets. So, Issa. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, this is a exceptional time for me as a uh, checkpoint to my career so um, and in this career, uh, degree I'm getting um, and so uh, I want to quickly um, just give you guys a background about what I'm trying to do and so that because this is a multidisciplinary uh, topic I'll be going through several different domains and topics rather over the top and so I just want to make sure that we stay on the message and the point is that there are rare cellular subsets when you have a homogeneous mix. And there are some populations of them that are very rare relative in frequency that are deterministic for health or action or they're actionable for healthcare. And so um, that's the, the, the thing I'm proposing here, a, a computational tool that will get at those rare cellular subsets. However, those rare cellular subsets could be spread around in multiple domains of biology, and we'll get into that. But in the end, my proposal is within computational biology and is proposing to look at a, a computational framework in a way to be able to analyze various biological data. And as a motivational case, I want to bring about two um, uh, causative agents, two pathogens that I've worked with so far in my career, HIV and uh, microbacterium tuberculosis. Um, together, in the 2015, they killed three million people worldwide. And there are, comp there are even complications where they, when both of those um, are combined. However, although there are treatments and there, although there are potential vaccines, for, um, they're not effective. These diseases um, change over time if you don't take the drugs right. And therefore, uh, we need, these are important uh, challenges currently. And ideally, kind of where we're going with this is being able to identify these protective cellular immunophenotypes that are, could, that are potentially rare a lot of times in the immune system. And therefore, being able to vaccinate someone in this, and this window of opportunity where these protective immunophenotypes are working, and hopefully they'll not cause this, like on this un unvaccinated person or persons have a high viral load, which eventually, this is by day 56, but by day 100 and beyond, they'll, they'll come back up and go towards AIDS. Whereas the goal is to be protected. And so that's why those cellular immunophenotypes, sometimes rare, are important. So what am I talking about single cells? Um, what does it mean And uh, when, I'm, when we're looking at cells? And in majority, and since this comes from the immunology world, it's a, I'll explain it's a basic picture of a T cell. But in, in idea, you have the nuclear envelope or the, the, uh, the cytoplasm or the membrane up there. And so there are proteins or markers or sugars or some stuff that are spread out, we identify as markers that we can tag using antibodies specifically to them. Those antibodies could have a fluorophore or a metal bead and the mass can identify that specific antibody bind, bound to that marker of interest. And in a way, we can get single cell resolution of specific targets 
um, so that we can identify who or what this cell is and what its function is. And as you can imagine, th and as a general example, these accumulate. And it's not just one molecule of this because it's in 3D, right? So on the surface, there's many of these proteins expressed. And as a combination of all of them, it defines, again, who this cell and what its function is. Traditionally, flow cytometers, immunologists, cancer biologists, when they look at cellular subsets, they use flow cytometry using the antibody method that I to to uh, talked about. And they look at these pairwise gating systems that they drill down on. So the first screen they see, for example, is they gate on T cells, which is used by CD3 marker. They gate out, for example, negative gate out specific types of T cells they don't want. So these are gamma delta T cells. We don't want them. So we gate the, the lower one and so forth until we get to the population that we want. And you can imagine, as we're drilling down into these populations, the downstream gets rare and rare and, le and less frequent. And, and that's uh, one of the challenges. And you can easily imagine where you place these gates upstream affects the population you choose downstream. And how is this used, is this data is used? One way is used is to look at the frequency of an immunophenotype that's important or protective or not. So let's say in the no protection group, it's higher than the protection group. We can insinuate that that correlates with no protection. Um, on the other hand, we can think of as a single marker expression, like let's say proliferation, like KCC7, where we're looking at specifically, if it's like let's say that cell is proliferating, and we look at that marker expression. Um, so in those two ways are the majority of the ways we're looking at it. There, there are other ways, but the majority of the ways we look at flow data is these two. And again, um, we're looking at in immunology and infectious diseases, we're, so we're looking at these protective immunophenotypes. And when I'm talking about a rare cellular subset, I'm talking about, imagine if you know, up there is 50-50, like one to one, and we're talking about rare being less than 10% in general of a total heterogeneous mix. mix. And again, you can imagine stem cell biology and the falls even to farther down here where the stem cells are even less frequent than potentially some of the immunophenotypes that we're interested in. And as well in cancers, like circulating um, blood cells, or even um, also those cancer seeding stem cells, they're also very rare. And therefore, we need to think about if they're actionable, so if they can be prognostic, diagnostic, or therapeutic um, phenotypes within that. And in fact, it's a, a hallmark of the adaptive immune system to be creating this heterogeneous subsets, to create these rare cellular subsets that identify specific pathogens. And that's how we can protect that cell. And in a, the adaptive immune system's evolution is for this purpose, is because there's plethora of stuff out there. How do you get at it? Um, and so the adaptive system works. Kind of in cancer is the same thing. Um, heterogeneity is one of those major uh, hallmarks. And it being rare subsets, at different time points across the tumor, for example, can be indicative, actionable in terms of uh, prognostic, diagnostic, or therapeutic. And so sometimes identifying even a rare cell early in time could be prognostic of, or diagnostic or therapeutic of that. So uh, clinically actionable. So now that I've described how they're, uh, um, why they're important, how we look at them, computationally, what are, we, uh, what are we doing? And there's three major things. And the, the one is to be able to classify those cells robustly and reproducibly, to be able to identify clinical correlates, and to visualize the phenotypic landscape as a whole. Those are the three tasks we're doing. And in this proposal, I'm, that's why it's darker, focusing mostly on the top part, the top one. But the, the other two must also be part of the idea in the back of our heads where we're thinking about the bigger picture. And in the end, we're doing these comparative phenotyping to understand this immunopathophysiology of the, uh, what we're looking at. So to, the, to that note of computationally being able to analyze flow data, the, a while back there was a flow cap uh, data set challenge, number one, which was targeting at specifically classifying immunophenotypes. And in that uh, challenge, the, the the results majority showed that computational methods are much better than any human method. They reduce the 
variance in analysis, and uh, even if those center is a center for doing a, a, a task rather than individuals doing, so even superhuman training is less uh, causes more variance than computational, and computational, most important, is reproducible, whereas it's harder to reproduce something a human does. Um, and in general, one of the things that um, uh, they report on uh, is, um, is using an F measure, which I'll get into a little later, but uh, F measure has a range of 0 to 1, and not 0.9 is pretty high up there, and so they're happy with it. But in FlowCap 1, they weren't looking at rare cellular subsets. So come FlowCap 3, because once we have a good foundation for computationally looking at things, well, what are the bottlenecks? And FlowCap 3 had a challenge specifically looking at rare cellular subsets. And on average, the two populations that they have for us to work with are on about 0.02% and 0.04% of the total heterogeneous mix. And in this data set, they're looking at T cells that are stimulated using HIV proteins in an assay where you put in the uh, antigens and the T cells pass a certain amount of time, they accumulate the cytokines they need, um, and that's blocked so they don't release it. And so then those cells are passed through a full cytometer, and then you know which cell detected the antigen and thus responded with the cytokine. They're rare because that antigen that is detecting is, in a way, being detected by a very rare cellular phenotype as a whole and matching that sequence. So that's the cell type we're interested in uh, as, a, as a classification challenge uh, going to this uh, proposal. And it is important for us to, um, to consider, when we're looking at something like rare cellular subsets, there's technical variability and biological variability that heavily confounds it. And either it's batch reagents, one lab could use one antibody that I showed earlier, another lab uses another lab uh, antibody, that could cause a difference in that definition of that subtype we're looking at. And the SOPs and the instrumentations could be different, um, as well as the various biological variability and some of the even general demographics like gender and, and age. And this is the F measure I, I put in here so we can quickly just talk about it. I F measure is a harmonic mean of uh, precision and recall. And if, uh, if you remember, recall is simply how many of them do we predict? And precision is simply how many of them did we predict correctly? And so uh, with this, and as I said, the range is between zero and one, that's where, that's the measurement we're gonna be using, but not as a whole, but specifically looking at those rare cellular subsets. So on flow cap data number three, which focuses on rare cellular subsets, there was a, uh, the top performing algorithm was done by Peng Kui in 2015 that got an F measure of 0.69. The model breaks down into three parts, and I'll briefly explain the, its parts. Um, but in general, there is a training part where you have some training data, and the, the data that it has, that means it has the gold standard, it's been gated, it's clean and everything, and so it, the machine learning algorithm has to learn from it. And then you have your test data, which you bring in, and you're asking it, that it's not labeled, and you're asking it to predict on. And, and the way they approach it is through an ensemble majority vote, which it means, and I'll get a little deeper of what, a, what the SVM is doing, but imagine it as a, just a single classification model for each one, and if you do it 50 times, and you're getting this vote of is this a rare cellular subset or not, and you get the majority vote. That's the way they approach this. And a quick definition for what the support vector machine is, because that's the model they use, is that a support vector machine is a uh, algorithm or machine learning uh, per, um, um, fr a framework where it's trying to find a hyperplane or a line that completely separates the, the two classes that maximizes their separation. And so here's a 2D example. And the pink line, in a way, is trying to split the two. And in a more realistic case, I have a little toy example here in a 3D, and these are the same. They're just rotations of one another. And so you can see if I draw a hyperplane, not all the subsets is get, gated in, like to be on the positive side of that hyperplane. Some is left behind. And so that's one of its limitations of drawing a straight line when you're trying to gate. And that parallels what we're doing, what the manual gating was, because in a way that was also a straight line. In many cases, it, it needs more of a curved line or a angled line. And 
So if you imagine in this figure that all of those hyperblains of, from the 50 on, um, ensemble training, so training sets are put together on a new data set. So each of them will be chopping at different angles. And even if you have a mean, like the yellow one is the mean of them all, you can imagine that it's not doing the best job. And I'll have another picture that shows that. But there, that's kind of like for you to visualize how that this system is not the most perfect way of classifying these cellular subsets. And, and the ensemble method, how it can have issues with not always getting all of them. Uh, and the other part is that the supervised machine learning method used here, the, the underlying this super so-called vector machine, is a supervised method. And that means it's learning everything that it's seeing off that data set. So when it's trying to infer it on a new data set, it's assuming it's coming from the same mathematical properties, the same types of data set, and so forth. So that's why if there are, let's say, batch effects, realistically, a supervised model is learning the batch rather than the actual signal you're interested in. So that's another limitation. The, the way they focus on rare cellular subsets um, when they for their support vector machines, because generally support vector machines aren't good at getting uh, rare cellular subsets, is they have employed a downsampling mechanism, uh, where basically downsampling brings about a more balanced classes. So the more rare population in the end, and this, for example, if you think about it in terms of probability of being the rare cellular subset, and this is the density of the entire data set, this bump represents the our cells of interest, the rare ones, as opposed to these ones. And this is based on some probability of being a rare cellular subset, and they choose the top 20. And in a way, they're kind of focusing on the, that side, which is more focused on the rare cellular subset. That's how um, they're doing their downsampling, and kind of removing the effects of the larger populations in the data set. But as I said, there could be batch effects that they're learning. And to solve that problem, they're using a Hellinger divergence. And this visual I, I, I put in so that imagine if you have a new test data, and you just put it here. And the idea is, what are the most closest data sets that I can train on that potentially don't have that batch effect? So if you train on maybe these three, and you want to infer on this guy, Potentially, that's too far away, and thus you're learning on batch. Whereas the idea of this using this optimization, you're getting potentially at the closer ones, thus eliminating some of those issue, issues with batch and uh, confounding. <clears throat> so anyways, as I said, there are some li several limitations. Um, so the linear SVM, straight cut, um, the class imbalance, and the fact that downsampling could add its own bias, and the fact that there's similarity-based ranking is not a perfect solution to the fact that there's batch effects and there's other issues, and we just are finding the most similar data sets to train on. It's, it, it's a nice approach, but it's not the solution. Um, and kind of my proposal to solve some of these bottlenecks and still limitations in identifying rare cellular subsets is using transfer learning. Now, transfer learning is different than supervised learning that they use. Uh, in transfer learning, the assumption isn't in the training set, which is the new data set that you get, it does not need to come from the same mathematical domain or the same data source. And therefore, it can make the inference on such a new um, data. And so, but the, the base of the model, as I try to show here, there's some training involved, and then there's some inference involved. And Li et al. in 2012 developed a transfer learning algorithm for flow cytometric analysis. However, their focus was a different cell subset. It was a larger cell subset. It wasn't as high dimensional as we're looking at today. And so part of the uh, thing that we, uh, uh, part of the motivation for going beyond this is going to higher dimensions, going on bigger files, and at the same time focusing on uh, some of the limitations that were going to be addressed uh, by transfer learning. And the, just a brief overview of uh, the Lee et al's transfer learning approach um, is that, again, there's some training involved. And from the training, there's multiple SVMs trained, which there yield that average um, hyperplane that I showed. But just, that's just the concept. 
So as a concept, it's learnt the idea of a hyperplane of a mean where it can be. And so now when you give it a new test data, it's not just inferring that directly on that data based on its tr previous training. It's looking at the data that it's being trained on, I mean, sorry, that it's being tested on directly to find the best place, the low density solution here. So in a way, it learns the idea I need to put a line, but then it doesn't infer like that. It transfers that idea to the new data set. So it's directly making that um, discrimination boundary put on the data set so that that does a better job at just looking at doing, uh, inferring with a supervised method. And to show you visually what that means is that this is a, again, a toy data. And here, this hyperplane kind of like is going out that way is the mean of my training set. And so you can see it's cutting through the blue dots that I care about. Whereas once I've trained, uh, once I transferred the, the, the hyperplane to the optimal place, it's more cutting the blue ones that I want. Sure, it's not perfect because those two populations are very close to each other. Um, their effect size is small. And so, uh, so therefore, uh, sorry, the right, but at the same time, you're still cutting the, uh, the, the line uh, at a better place than it was originally. And kind of where that comes from is that there's two parts to it. There's a bias shift and a rotation of the hyperplane. And so if you imagine uh, like a samurai chopping across this uh, data set, and then once it's finding the optimal uh, bias shift, it's finding the optimal rotation. And if you do this iteratively back and forth, you find the most optimal place. So um, comparing the two methods between Quirao and Lirao is that they had a support vector machine model with an ensemble. And the core of the transfer learning is also a support vector machine because it's doing that same hyperplane prediction. But it's in a transfer learning framework, so it's not doing direct inference like supervised method. Currently, the lead out method does not have a RCS optimization, and that's something that I have to focus on. Potentially, the first strategy is to use similar way that the queried out used. However, there are several different ones that we can uh, explore and find the best one uh, that makes sense for our case. Um, and at the same time, there's no need for doing a Hellinger divergence like they do because our transfer learning framework solves that problem. So we don't even do, so that's the part that is in our advantage. As, a, as an addition, uh, thing to uh, add to our model, we're gonna add a confounder corrected SVM, uh, which means that uh, we're trying to eliminate the effect of uh, confounder variance on the outcome. And in a way, um, if you think about it, if you're training on let's say a bunch of data that came from women, and then you're trying to infer on a data that came from a man, potentially that could work, it may not. And so these confounders could have an effect on our inference, and so we need to account for them. And so uh, the real thing though is, some, is par partly um, affected by the confounding factors at the variance stage. So that's something that we'll, we'll put into our model. So specific aim one. So develop a transfer learning uh, flow cytometric quantitative framework to identify these rare cellular subsets such as immunophenotypes while evaluating and minimizing the variance to batch, confounding factors, covariance, and nonlinearity uh, of the discrimination boundary. So like I said, if it's nonlinear, you can probably catch more of them. But at the same time, you can imagine that adds complexity issues. And so we have to balance those two together. Um, and also, there's also a concept of dimensionality reduction, where you reduce the, hyper, the, the high dimensionality of the data set, and you're trying to look for them in a low dimensional space. Um, the simplest one would be TCA, more complicated one being TSNE. But at the same time, there are other opportunities for search potentially out of scope for this proposal, but um, still a lot of area to investigate. To kind of give you guys a picture of what the framework will look like, so. As I said, we'll have the FlowCap Data 3 data set to build this framework and also some simulated data sets. And we'll have some meta data files like the, the confounding factors, platform, gender, and so forth, and the F main FCS file. And there'll be some learning part of it uh, in the transfer learning and of course some inference. And what we'll get out is these cellular populations that we trained on, whatever it was, 
and we'll get some central tendency, some frequency, and some information about the model fitness and parameters. So it'll give us some confidence in our prediction and so forth. And the most important thing is like, why are we doing this? Is like, once we have these um, uh, rare slater subsets gated, and potentially they could be correlated to disease and being like these um, protective immune phenotypes that I, for example, talked about, or actionable phenotypes in cancer, we are really have to map them to these five conceptual dimensions of phenomics, where we've defined them in a way with this method of flow cytometry analysis. And in a way, the idea of what, that, what they mean and the uh, information behind them came from acquiring uh, the data and the, the, uh, uh, all the a priori on what the immunophenotypes define each. The representation is something that, for example, ontology is how phenotypes are computationally um, uh, structured and represented because as just text, they, they're meaningless. Um, so we, I can call them a CD4 memory cell, but computationally that means nothing. Um, and their interoperability, like once we find these immunophenotypes that are important, maybe I'm studying in the rhesus model and I want to be able to bring it into the human model. And so this interoperability is important as well. And finally, processing is that what are we going to do with the end goal? Like is it QTL analysis? Is it just doing correlation with clinical data? Whatever it is, we have to be conscious of the utility or the processing of the, of the, the, the phenotypes or immunophenotypes that we find through our rare cellular subsets. And as a case example, I want to focus on uh, these, uh, a specific group of rare cellular subsets called mates, or we closely associate invariant T cells, which are a type of T cell, uh, which I'll get into why they're critical in a second, but just as a whole, in adults, they represent somewhere between 1% to 10% in the blood. And in the newborn cord blood, they're somewhere between 1% and lower. And uh, that creates a challenge if we're trying to identify them in one tissue versus the other. So even if I train on one data set, most supervised learning methods will fail at doing this because it's a completely different domain. But that's the beauty of transfer learning, is that the hope would be able to learn on one domain and infer on the other one despite the, the differences. And as I promised, uh, quick information why we care about these mates, why they're important, as the, the majority of the lab that studies them are sitting right over there, is that um, these cells are restricted by unique antigen-presenting cells different than the, the ones that classical T cells are. MR1 is a molecule that's relatively non-polymorphic across different species in animals, which means that they're representing or presenting these antigens that are common across these species, potentially at least by sequence. That's one key thing. In, in humans, what they've been shown is they detect microorganisms such as MTV. They respond into MTV. And therefore, they are ha they've been studied for their roles in early mucosal immunity. And they, they exist in life from early on in newborn to adult life. And in fact, um, that's where we're looking at. We're looking at newborn cord blood data. And so, um, and the other most important thing about them is this innate functional capacity. Just unlike any other T cell that requires training in the thymus and that uh, up selection and down selection that they go through, these cells don't need that sort of a training or selection in a way. They are functional when you get them from an um, infant from the thymus, from wherever you find them, you put them in a culture, they'll respond to antigens. And so that, that's another unique property about them, which goes back to thinking about their role in early mucosal immunity, especially earlier in life. And why are they, you know, infants, for example, get more t uh, infections, uh, such pulmonary infections such as TB versus uh, adults, less so. Um, they're less likely to get complications. Anyway, so towards that um, specific aim too, um, identify phenotypic mate cells in two diverging developmentally associated tissues, PBMCs coming from blood, uh, from blood of adults, and cord blood cells from newborn. And so we want to look at these um, mate cells in, in within our framework to I, first to classify them, and then to be able to then drill down once we've classified them to, to understand their biology and what's different. And kind of to give you a visual of what we're expecting is that there are a bunch of these additional markers that are indicative of their developmental stage, their function, and so forth. So once we can identify them in across the two um, data sets, we can then study their biology and their role in um, protective immunity and just general health uh, immunity. Um, and the 
picture I showed earlier was uh, HIV vaccine that kind of is projected, and this is kind of adapted to be for TB, but because TB has this sort of a reactivation, so forth. But the idea is the same. By studying these immune subsets that are important to protection, we want to create a vaccine that gives you either sterile or complete protection. And that's the, the whole point of, at least in immunology, what I've been trying to work with, uh, with the Lewinson lab, is to be able to contribute to finding and understanding these immunophenotypes that are potentially important in protective immunity. And going to the future, and kind of out of the scope of this um, proposal I'm making currently, is that once we've developed our um, kind of like our framework to study uh, rare failure subset is within the transfer learning framework, there are other ways of like improving and thinking about um, that we can take the direction of uh, trying to answer research or clinical needs. And either the model can be improved, the, as I said, the optimization for RCS can be improved, and at the same time, we can uh, expand into several different ways of the rotation and uh, the shift bias shift that I talked about. There's other ways of trying to do that as well. So that's kind of where, um, where we can go into there, uh, beyond. Um, and so with that, uh, I want to uh, give my acknowledgments to my mentors. There's a lot of names on this, but my... Uh, thank, I want to really thank uh, Dr. McQueenie and Dr. Lewinson and Mario, uh, who's not in the room today, uh, as well as my dissertation committee and all the other people who really helped me get it to this point. Um, thank you very much. It's incredible. And if I forgot someone, I, I apologize, but I tried to include all those I immediately remembered. But, um, but thank you. I appreciate it. I'll take any questions you guys have. Now it's your turn to grill me. I know I talk fast. I was trying not to, but I still talk fast. Go ahead, Josh. Um, they did cite that paper, um, but their um, point um, going forward is that this method potentially is more optimized there uh, to be faster. Um, but in terms of like coming to biology, there has not been shown a, a method that compares this method to that method directly using this standard data set. And kind of what I'm trying to show as the first step is that, to show is this transfer learning, because in theory sounds better, not just for batch effects, but just for the fact that we can infer on a new data set that came from anywhere that kind of has the same subset of interest. That way we can potentially be beneficial no matter what, and we'll compare it to this same data set and we'll see how well it performs. That's kind of the first path. Um, in short, it's doing a gradient descent um, to find the, the minima that best cuts the, um, the slice <laughs> in the high dimension. And then so the, in general, is doing, um, one is doing a projection of the, um, the, the, the new data set into the direction of the um, kernel density estimate of the training. And so that way you kind of can, you're on the same trajectory and therefore you can make the inference in the same kind of logic. And so you find the, the, um, the lower point of the minima in that regard, and that's kind of where it is. And the same iteration, you're finding the rotation as well, besides the bias shift.
yes. In a way, partially, I think that the new data set has to be not be completely random, right? But it has to have the same, uh, in a way, concept of being able to find that population. But in, in its theory, it, the whole idea is to be able to put the new data set within the same projection of the old training that you have so that they're similar in terms of the, the transfer you're trying to make. So because, yeah. Um, yes, and I think that the, 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 the trick is, I think if you imagine in, in high dimensional space, like even in, in the data sets, could, they're not necessarily, because of the batch, because of whatever, they're not necessarily aligned. These in, in high dimensional space, they won't be completely aligned. So we have to somehow, the new data set be aligned to the, the training set. And that is done through kind of geometric math, but yeah. In a way, it's kind of like, yeah, I have to find the, um, the normal vector to that bias, um, the mean that I find. So that kind of creates the vector trajectory where I'm doing the, um, the bias shift. And once I find the right place there, it's doing the rotation from there. So it's kind of like um, an iterative process. It, it, does not, it doesn't come to like a one go, it doesn't come to a single answer. In the, in the domain of transfer learning, there are several different cases. SVM is one of the most common ones, um, but no, you can pretty much use several different kinds. They're ex they get more complicated. I think, like, imagine trying to transfer a more curvier shape, geometric shape, as opposed to a straight line. It makes it more difficult. Right? In, in the case that I'm proposing, yes. But I would like to investigate the nonlinearity, um, but with the limitation of it causing complexity and therefore losing meaning, translation, and at the same time, time, as in time. Sorry, was that a hand or was that? Well, I mean, that's kind of out of scope. I'm not going to talk a little far out on that. Uh, so the idea of why, for example, this could be better is, I, I think I left for another talk. I actually will not talk about it in this room. But there, the potentially, the only thing, the major thing that I, this will solve, I think, as opposed to that, is over there we're defining these, maybe these hyperplanes. And over here we're defining multiple hyperplanes in sort of like a tree method. And so, oopsie. And so that's why potentially that could be beneficial in some studies when they compare the two, get better, but it's not guaranteed for rare studies or subsets, so that's something we have to investigate if we go down that path. Um, because the... Uh, um, I actually don't, I don't have a biological answer to why that could be better. Um, because they're hierarchical immune full subsets. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, that's why I think that they also potentially could work. Um, but they haven't been looked at, and they currently will be further downstream of what I would try to do in, for this proposal. Um, but it potentially, I agree. It, it, Um, well, it depends how you define the F. You can say the F of the act in the for the rail cellular subset, not as a comp as a whole. Um, but but the way they've defined it in the full cap one data is looking at the whole as kind of like an average of it all. But when I have to present it, I have to look at an F measure of the specifically getting at the rail cellular subset. But there is a another um, version of it that specifically balances the precision versus recall, just has like a one minus beta thing next to it. But nonetheless, it, you can balance which one you want to favor, either more recall or precision. Um, but I think that in terms of being able to get at a direct comparison, the F measure will be a good comparison to use. Um, So that's, that's why we can balance it. But I don't want to, I didn't propose that directly because that's not, that won't be a direct comparison to what's already been done. Because um, I want to compare to Quiet et al's paper um, because that's the data set we're using and everything. But yeah, I mean, if we're trying to tune it to potentially either try to describe it in different ways, we can use other ways of looking at it. What do you mean? Like their their model? Mm. I mean, I I'm not creating the 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 Quiet Al framework, I, um, but on my fr oh the software no no I don't have access to the I have access to the flow cap data, and therefore that's why I, I, sticking with the F measure will at least get me closer closest possible without having the. Exactly. But that's not going to stop me from thinking it of a better thing that I think is better and writing it and saying, well, this is a better measure. But, you know, that's just the foot down to you. <laughs> yeah, for evaluation. Exactly. Fair point. Exactly. No, I'm not trying to beat them at the F, actually. I'm trying to be the most accurately picking out the rail series subsets of interest and being able to then correct for some of the variance that is confounders and so forth so they can have a clean, robust, reproducible outcome in the end. That's their goal. Um, and beating their score is a bonus. <laughs> yes? So you, um, does your, your data um, is a more of a, a kind of classification into buckets? Uh, it's not a ranked kind of output, no. is it? Okay, because I mean, if it were ranked, and you know, there's all kinds of um, measures, you know, that combine recall and precision, but, but if it's, if it is a classification into buckets, then that wouldn't work. But if you did have a task that were ranked in output, you know, there, there are plenty of measures that, that use recall and precision and combine them and, um, you know, that take into account the, as you go down the ranking. Thank you. Yes, uh, absolutely. But again, I try to be tight as possible to be consistent. But I would love to go further on these things and investigate them afterwards. Uh, getting the PhD so forth. I mean, this is a whole uh, domain of transfer learning that I can keep expanding and trying to tune um, to clinical needs and research needs. Okay. Hold it, hold it. So Issa, I have a kind of a question for asking what you mean by a confounder. You know, that is, is that something you have to predefine? Or is that something that will fall out of your analysis as you compare different data sets? Yeah. Um, in the flow cap data that I have, the confounders are um, gender, 
age um, platform of the Excitop for flow, um, fluorescent flow. Um, and I think those are the three major ones that I have the most uh, robust data for, but I haven't um, done an exploratory data analysis on that data because I don't fully have access to it yet. But yeah, in general, that's kind of like, I, I would imagine as much as metadata we can collect, we can put in the confounders. That's why early on we were talking about getting access to clinical data from you. But, um, it, you know, since that goes limited with our data set, as much as I can get from the flow cap, um, I'll put in. Um, and I've looked at the algorithm at simplest form is a matter of zero, one, like this is like, let's say female, male, stuff like that. And that is very broadly looking at some of those confounders. But, um, but again, it, it, it can go deep drilled down further, um, depending on what we collect. So hopefully we can in the future collect data with good metadata with you. Mike. Another question about evaluation. Sure. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you, you um, uh, mentioned that for the more frequent cell populations, computational methods are as good or, or better than manual gating. Do you have a sense of how well your algorithm will have to be to match manual gating for the rare cellular subtype? Is there, is there more variation in how people mm -hmm. manually gate for those smaller uh, subtypes? Um, I don't have a feeling for it just yet because I don't have I haven't run real data in my in the framework yet, but um, I do think that the variation in the data sets will be solved by the properties of transfer learning. Like for example, if your training uh, has some noise, it, it's still getting at a very general hyperplane from it, and then transferring that to the data set, sorry, uh, to the test set. Um, so. I, if I'm answering your question right, your, your concern is about if the data training set adds too much variance. Is that right? Well, so, so I, I just meant, are, is there more disagreement among people when they do gating for rare cellular subtypes mm -hmm. than, there, than there is for uh, more frequent? Oh, I see. Subtypes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah. Okay. Um, absolutely. The humans all equally make as much mistakes, you know, when we're trying to make, um, not equally, uh, com I mean, compared to computational methods, because these rare cellular subtypes are hard, humans are not, are not, it's not an easy task for humans either. So, but it's not equally as variant as the, um, the more dominant populations, as, as I showed that early slide, when we're looking at those big populations, it's easy to draw the boundary. Whereas then, then the smaller populations, then it's more of a cloud, uh, nebulous cloud that's hard to find the boundary for. And so absolutely, the difficulty comes, thank you, from that. Yeah, seems like no more questions. Um, could you speak a little bit about, I know you kind of mentioned already, just a little bit more about why you decided to start from, I mean, I assume it's mostly just the complexity issue of not choosing a nonlinear approach. Um, I chose the linear approach as the first path to compare with the um, Quid et al, because they also have a linear SEM. But I would like to explore the nonlinearity. I just don't know how much that will give us. Um, I definitely, in how I see them and these populations in that high dimensional space not being always linear, but at the same time, if they're separable enough, a linear boundary should be good enough, right? So the question is, so making sure our input data is clean, so our output is also clean. Is, is the other part of it. Okay. I guess we'll wrap it up with that. Thank you very much for attending and listening. Thank you.